Hey everyone, my name is Naomi and in this channel we help students revise for the exams and most specifically the building and civil engineering students to get all the concepts right so that they can be able to do their exams well and also to prepare for the industry so that they can be able to learn all the concepts that are needed. In this series we, shall, we are going to be looking at the most common questions in NEC exams and we shall be going through the NEC papers. In Kenyan system we use the NEC exams and there are those questions that are usually mostly asked and in this presentation we are going to go through the 2018 November NEC exam for estimation and costing and measurements and we are going to go through specifically through the theory parts. So welcome and feel appreciated. So the first question we are going to look at is define each of the following terms as used in measurements. So we are going to define the following terms. One is the provisional sum. The provisional sum is that allowance that we put in the bill of quantities for those works that we cannot be able to know their details well before we get to site. In, uh, in the provisional sum, there are works like substructure works, which we have to go to site so that we know the extent so that we can be able to accurately price. For example, a site may look very clean, but when you go to excavate, we find that there are large limestone rocks beneath. So, um, that sum, that allowance that we insert in the bill of quantities to cater for works that we cannot be able to estimate uh, accurately when the tender documents are given to the contractor and they have to go to site so that they can get enough details is called the provisional sum. It means that this provisional sum, it may change, it may be more or it can be less once we go to the site to look at the details. The that you are going to define is the spot items. Spot items, they are those items when you go to a site to be able to see before we start constructing. We may find trees, we may find old buildings, we may find things that we need to do away with. Because we need to incur some costs in removing all these things from the site, we need to take to account the number of items in, this, in that site. So these items are supposed to be estimated, they are priced by an estimator. And in the bill of quantity, we will call them the spot items. The next one is the penultimate certificate. The penultimate certificate is the certificate issued by an architect to a contractor showing that all the works have been carried out according to the conditions of the contract. This happens when during practical completion of the project. This means that uh, practical completion is that period that the contractor has already cons finished constructing and now he's only waiting to maintain the building for six months. So when the contractor completes the project, he's going to be paid for all the work that he has been doing. So the, that one, that certificate that will be given is the penultimate certificate. The next term is variations. Variations, they are alterations to the scope of work either by addition, substitution or omission from the original scope of work. The original scope of work is usually defined by the drawings and the specification. In case there are any changes, for example, an architect, the architect says that we should add a wall or a window. That one is variations by addition. In case we substitute, for example, we were to install steel windows, then we change them to aluminium windows. That is by substitution. In case there were supposed to be as windows, then the architect instructs that there should not, the, the window should be done away with. That is omission. So variations, there are these alterations to the scope of work, either by addition, substitution, or omission from the original scope of work. The second question is outline four contract documents. 
so I'm going to explain them. The first contract document is the working drawings. The working drawings include the plans, sections, elevations, and even the large-scale drawings of the proposed construction project. For example, the drawings that shows the floor plan, the elevation that is the side views, the sections is when you cut the, the building, maybe horizontally, the, so that it can be able to show the details. Then we may have the large scale details of the site to show where the building will be placed in proportion to the site. The next one is specifications. Specifications, they are documents written by the architect to supplement the drawings. All the details that the architect was not able to place in the drawings, he does them in the specification documents. The specification documents usually specify the nature, the class of work, and the materials to be used in the different elements of the building. Number three is the bill of quantities. The bill of quantities is a document that is prepared by the quantity surveyor, which is used in tendering so that you can be able to determine the best suitable contractor for the tender. The, the bill of quantities usually explains the type of materials, the method of work, and the quantities of work to be carried out. During the contract agreement, the bill of quantity is the document that will be used to agree on the contract. So that the contractor is he knows that he is responsible for delivering according to the bill of quantities. In case there are any alterations, the variations, we shall come to price them according to the bill of quantity that was agreed upon by the contractor and the clients. Number four is the form of tender. It's a preprinted formal offer for the contractor that will he agree to do the work that he has been offered. The form of tender, usually the contractor usually fills in the summary of the bill of quantities. So it actually makes it easier for the tender evaluation committee to compare the tenders to be able to award it to the appropriate contractor. Number five is the schedule of rates. The schedule of rates is in appearance like a bill of quantities, but the only difference is that the schedule of rates does not have the prices, so it has the quantities. So the contractors are supposed to go filling in the, uh, the rates for each and every item so that in the end they can be able to come up with the total cost of the building. So the schedule of rates is a document that in appearance looks like a bill of quantities that is used by the contractor so that they can be able to fill in the rates for each item to be able to get the total cost of the project. The next one is the form of agreement. This is a legal document signed by both parties, the contractor and the client agreeing to, to perform according to the conditions of the contract that the client will deliver the payment to the contractor and also the contractor will deliver the project to the clients. So that agreement that they make and they sign is usually on the form of agreement. The last document is the conditions of contract. These are clauses in the agreement of which is stated and observed by the construction team. The construction team involves the consultants, the clients, the contractor, and in these conditions of contract, it states clearly the obligations of each and every person. For example, it states the obligations of the client, the contractor, the, the engineer, the mechanical engineer, the electrical engineer. So in the conditions of contract, it, is, it states clearly the obligations of everyone in the construction project. So the contract documents that are used in, the, in a construction project, one is the working drawings, specifications, the form of agreement, form of tender, the conditions of contract, and the schedule of rates. Uh, we shall go to the next question, 
which is explain the process used in a traditional method of preparing a bill of quantities. This is a very common question in exams. And in the traditional method of preparing bill of quantities, we start by taking off. Taking off, it involves entering the dimensions that are measured from the drawings in a specific paper called a dimension paper and stating the, the description very clearly against them. The dimensions entered in a taking off dimension column. In the dimension column of a taking, taking off sheet, they are called bookings. So the next step we do after taking off is squaring. Squaring is the process of multiplying the bookings in the dimension column to the units in the timesing column and entering the resultant in the squaring column. Remember in a taking takeoff sheet, we have three columns, then the description column. From the far end, we have the timesing column then the dimension column, then the squaring column, then the description column. In the timesing column, we usually multiply. For example, if we have two windows, we write two stroke. In the dimension column, we state the dimensions of the item that we are measuring by length, the width, the height. In the squaring column, that's where we shall write the answer that we get by multiplication of the bookings in the dimension column by the item on the time scene column. The next step after squaring is abstracting. Abstracting involves entering the squared dimensions in an abstracting sheet. In the abstracting sheets, we usually have subheadings for every work. For example, walls, internal walls. So we shall go take the squared dimensions in the takeoff sheet for the first floor internal walls. We go to the second floor internal walls, third floor internal walls. We come and summarize them in the abstracting sheet. When we, are when we are summarizing them, we usually summarize them according to the headings. For example, we group the internal walls. We write all of them first, ground floor, first floor, second floor, third floor. We come to the uh, external walls, we measure, we take the square dimensions from the takeoff sheets for first floor, second floor, third floor. We come for the floor area, we go measure, we go pick the square dimensions from the takeoff sheets from the beginning to the last floor. So that's summarizing of the square dimensions into section subheadings, it's called abstracting, which we do in preparation for billing. When we are abstracting, we are going to cross over the, the dimension, the, uh, the items that we are picking from the takeoff sheet using a vertical, a vertical line to show that these dimensions, these squared dimensions have already been picked and placed in the abstracting sheets. So, uh, the Abstracting sheets, when we are cross-checking, we shall be able to see that we have placed all the items in the takeoff sheet into the abstracting sheets. The last step of the traditional method is billing. Billing is the process of transferring the reduced quantities and descriptions from the abstracting sheets to the billing paper, ready for pricing. In the in the process of billing, we enter the quantity, the, ra the rates and the quantities together with the description, lifting them from the abstracting sheets. So we shall go to the abstracting sheets, lift the description, place it in the, in the bill paper. We take the quantity from the abstracting sheet, we, we place it on the bill paper. We take the unit from the abstracting sheet, we place them in the billing paper and finally we take the rate from the sources of information for rates, for costs, then we place it in the rates. If you want to know about the costs, costs the sources of information of costs, we shall look at them in another video. That is the process of 
uh, of preparing a bill of quantity using the traditional method. So we started with taking off, then squaring, then abstracting, then finally billing. The next question you are going to answer is explain four factors considered when choosing a method of appropriate approximate estimating to be used. Approximate estimating is when we are estimating the cost of a building either so accurately or just giving a tentative price. In estimating and in approximate estimation methods we usually do them at different stages of the building. For example, there are those that are done before the client decides to do the project. There are those that are done after the drawings. So the question is asking the factors considered when choosing which approximate estimating method to be used. One is the information available. In cases where the client has not even done the drawings, he just wants to do a feasibility study on what to construct. On that, in that instant, we are going to use the method like the functional unit method, whereby we just use just a method so that we can come up with a, with a rough estimate. But in case the drawings are already done and we already know even the specifications to be used, we are going to use a more complex method like doing the bill of quantities so that you can get the price accurately. So that point is the information available if there is a drawing or there is no drawing. The next factor we should consider is the time available. How long does the client need? What time duration is he giving us to give him a, the price? If he wants the price in five minutes, we are going to use a a rough method of coming up with the price, for example, the functional unit method. But if he gives us enough time, we may come up with a bill of quantity which is much more detailed. So that point is the time available. The third point is the degree of accuracy required. If the clients just want an estimate, a rough estimate of the cost of a building, for example, he's just asking, what is the cost of a five-bedroomed house, approximately? That one, we may use a very, a very simple method to come up with the cost, for example, the functional unit method. But if he needs total accuracy, so we shall have to come up with a bill of quantity that states the cost of item by item with specifications to the materials and method of work. The last factor we consider when choosing an approximating method is the experience of the estimator. In case it's just a fundi who is coming up with the price, he may not be well experienced with the prices in the market. So we shall use a rough method of coming up with the prices. Maybe you can even use the area method, whereby we shall just multiply by the cost per area. But in case the estimator is well experienced, we may use a bill of quantity. Another example, if, if the estimator is well experienced, he may be able to accurately price per square meter. But if he's not well experienced, we will have to do a bill of quantities so that we can be able to come up with an accurate price. So that is either way, the, estimate, the experience of the estimator. So, uh, the four factors considered when choosing an approximate estimating method, one is the information available, time available, degree of accuracy required, and four, the experience of the estimator. The next question is describe each of the following tendering methods stating two advantages of each. Uh, so we shall, I'm going to explain the two different tendering methods. One is the selective tendering. In selective tendering, this is where only the shortlisted contractors are invited to tender for a construction project. 
This one is usually done to improve the quality of the bids received because already we know these contractors. We come, we decide who should we invite to tender so that to improve on the quality of bids, we know that they do good work to ensure that the contractors with the necessary experience, manpower and competence are given the necessary opportunity to submit their tenders. So, in selective tendering, why we invite only specific contractors is because we know them and we know that they are competent enough and they have the necessary experience. So, we invite only those contractors that we know can deliver on the work to submit their tenders. And the advantage of this selective tendering is because we know these contractors and we know that they are competent enough, we will not use a lot of time in shortlisting them just like the open tendering. So, one, we shall save on time. Two, they will be able to deliver what is expected of the project because already they are capable. And like in open tendering, where we give uh, contractors who we do not know the tender and they may fail to deliver. Uh, the second uh, the second part is explain open tendering. Open tendering is where everyone, every contractor is invited to tender. So in these tenders, mostly we advertise for them. There is invitation for tenders. So any contractor who feels like he is capable to do the job will submit his tender. And there shall be an open tendering so that you can be able to evaluate on the lowest bidder so that we can give them the work. The advantages of uh, open tendering is we, shall, we are going to get a cheaper contractor. Unlike in other methods of tendering like the selective tendering, in open tendering we are going to get contractors who do a cheaper job because everyone will be able to quote the least he can do, quoting a very small profit margin. Highlight four sources of cost information, uh, the cost that we insert in a bill of quantities. Where does the cost, how, how, where do we get the cost information from? One is a priced bill of quantities. We can go to our previous bill of quantities that we had used and lift the prices from there. As long as the work, the building is going to be constructed in the same, around the same location, locality with the previous building. So we'll just read the rates from that bill of quantity. The next one is journals and magazines. They are usually journals and magazines which are released by quantity surveyors. Those journals usually have a section for the for the bill of quant for the costs that we can use in a bill of quantity so still there we can get the rates that we can use the third is the ministry of public works the ministry of public works usually have documents that have the rates of construction in a certain area so we can get the rates from there Another source of cost information is the quotations. The quotations that we receive from the suppliers, how much do they say that the items cost? That one is a soft source of cost information. It helps us to come up with the rates. Another one is we can build up the rates. How do we build up the rates? We shall calculate the material cost, the transportation cost, the labor cost, the profit and overheads. Then we calculate per meter, per meter squared or per meter cubic where appropriate. So to get the, to get the cost, we shall just come up with a unit rate. The last one is the JBC schedule of rates. The next question is explain each of the following terms used in estimation and costing. One is the overheads. Overheads, they are costs required for the running of the project. These ones mostly are indirect costs relating to the project. They help the project to run, but they are indirectly related to the project. For example, site huts. 
if we are building the site huts, these ones do not affect the project directly, but we need them so that we can be able to house the office. Another one is the toilets. We cannot do without toilets in the site, but still the cost of building the toilets will be classified in overheads because it affects the workers on site, but it does not affect directly the project. So overheads there, these costs that are required to run the site, but relate indirectly to the construction project. Second one is man hour. Man hour is the amount of work performed by one worker in one hour. Amount, average amount of work performed by a worker in one hour. For example, we can say the driver of the lorry. What is the average amount of work he can perform in one hour? For a skilled labor, what is the average amount of work that he can perform in one hour? Maybe for an excavating machine, for example, an excavator, how much work, how much sweat will it be able to excavate in one hour? So that one is the man hour. But for man hour is only for, for people. Amount of work performed by an average worker in one hour. The next one is define all in mechanical rates. All in mechanical rate is the term sounds is all in. It is a compounded rate. Compounded means we come up with a rate considering all the factors. For example, there are these equipment that we buy or the or hire. We shall calculate the cost for buying, the cost for insurance, the cost for all the costs related for getting the plant or the equipment, the mechanical plant or equipment. And also we shall include all the costs related to operating the equipment. For example, we shall use diesel, we shall use oil, we shall use we shall pay the drivers and the co-driver. So all these rate all these costs that are involved with the mechanical plant, when we come up with a rate per hour, how much it will cost us. That rate is usually called an all-in mechanical rate. The next one is the unit rate. What is a unit rate? It is the monetary value attached to every item. For example, whenever we are measuring uh, things in takeoff, we measure them in linear meters, in square meters, in cubic meters. The monetary value that we attach for every unit of measurement is usually called the unit rate. The next question we shall look at is explain four categories of wastage in materials. One of the categories is the liquid waste. The liquid waste includes all the liquids that are wasted in a construction site. There could be grease, oil, sludges that have been, that are that are wasted. Those are not which, wasted means that they are not in use. So first category, liquid waste. Second category is the solid waste. This involves anything solid, the garbages, the plastics, all those things that are solid, they lie in a category called solid waste. The third category is the organic waste. This is waste that decomposes in a construction project. It could be food from the workers, it could be all that waste, human waste, all those is, that one is organic waste, it is decomposable. The fourth one is the recyclable waste, mostly it involves the metals and the plastic. In case all that waste needs to be recycled, we classify it under recyclable waste. We can collect all that waste and recycle it or take it to a company where they can be recycled. The last waste is the hazardous waste. Hazardous means it is dangerous. It may be it's flammable, corrosive, toxic, reactive. So everything in a construction site that lies within those dimensions is classified under the hazardous waste. The next question is, describe the following methods of tendering in building projects. We have three methods of tendering in building projects. The first method is the open tendering. The open tendering is where the client advertises his project 
Then he invites any contractor to bid for the tender. In open tendering, mostly they ask for some down payment so that that money can be used in tender evaluation. In open tendering, uh, any contractor bids for the tender. So the client is likely to choose among the contractors who bid lowest, but around the tender price, which is quoted by the quantity surveyor. The open tendering method has an, uh, it has different, quite a number of disadvantages. For example, it is risky in terms of, because anyone is tendering for the job, the contractors may choose not to go into details of the tender because he does not have so many chances of being selected. So every contractor usually could just quote a price that is deemed to give him a profit. On the other side, if he just quotes a price and he did not go into details when he was choosing that, if that price for the tender, he's, it means that he has not gone through the details so that he can come up with a tender sum. And this project, in case of anything, he might not be able to do the project because maybe he does not have enough experience or skills to do the whole job because he did not go through to see the details. And also, he might put a very low price for the tender. Therefore, he might not be able to complete the project. The next method of tendering is the selective tendering. This is the method of tendering where the contractors are invited to apply for the tender so that they can be pre-qualified. So they are given a form to fill in their details, then they are pre-qualified. This means that they are shortlisted. Once they are shortlisted, the contractors can now send their tenders. When they send their tenders, the contractors, because they are not so many, because they were shortlisted and now they are fewer, the contractors have some assurance that they are likely to be chosen. So they will go into details, come up with a bill of quantities, which is a bit more accurate, then submit it for tendering. In this method, each contractor is a bit assured that they can be chosen. So it has an advantage in the sense that because every contractor was careful when doing the bill of quantities, there is likely to be very minimal errors and the contractor and the client can choose any contractor based on the, the minimum quotes that comes to him. The other method of tendering is the negotiated tendering. Negotiated tendering usually mostly applies where a specialized contractor is needed or a specific plant and equipment are needed or also in case there was work that was continuing and there comes up a new project related to the same project that was continuing the client may choose to continue with the same contractor so he will discuss the prices with the contractor who is doing the work then they will agree on the price so when they agree on the price, they will sign the contract. Uh, the advantage of negotiated tendering is that the, it is satisfactory to both the client and the contractor because they settle on a price that they have agreed on. Uh, the negotiated tendering is only allowed for private contr contracts, private clients. Because in the public, in public places, for example, in public schools, in places where it is government, uh, who is the client, it is not allowed according to the procurement process that should be used. Three types of tendering methods are open tendering, selective tendering, and negotiated tendering. Open tendering where all contractors are invited to bid for the tender. Selective tendering where only the shortlisted contractors are approached to bid for the tender. And the last one is negotiated tendering where the client approaches the contractor who was doing the work, then they negotiate on the remaining works and agree on a tender price.
The next question is state two reasons for referring substructure works as provisional. So, first of all, we said that provisional sum is that sum that we put in the bill of quantity for work that cannot be totally measured in details at the time of tendering. So we have to get to site so that we can get, know the details, so that we can be able to quote the price. So the question is, two reasons for referring substructure works as provisional. We know substructure works, they are works that happen below the ground. For example, basement works or the foundation. So why are they termed as provisional? One is because the substructure works are quite entirely and they cannot be entirely foreseen, defined and detailed at the type of tendering. We cannot be able to detail very clearly on the drawings the substructure works. For example, we cannot be able to detail the amount of water in the trenches in the drawings. So that's why, because we are only using the drawings and the specifications for, to guide us in, in quoting the price, the substructure works has the substructure works have to be quoted as provisional. The second reason why the substructure works is is quoted some of the substructure works are quoted as provisional is because the substructure works is so uncertain that no price can be estimated in advance. Sometimes there could be there could come so heavy rains that could cause the amount of water in the trenches to go up. Or the a site may look so clean, then we find so big limestone, limestone rocks beneath there. The substructure works because it's below the soil. The nature of them is so as uncertain that no price can be estimated in advance. We have to get to site so that we can know their extent. Question, state six roles of a quantity surveyor in the pre-contract stage. The pre-contract stage it is that stage in a construction project before the construction begins. So at this stage, we are still deciding whether to do the project and also if we have decided, we need now to prepare for the project. So the question is, what is the work of the quantity surveyor before the start of the project? One, it is to conduct the feasibility studies. Feasibility study is where we come, where the project team sits down and weigh if the project is viable or not? Is it possible to do the project? So, in case they will, they, they will look at so many factors. Is the, pro, is the client able to pay for the project? Is the, soil, uh, be, is the soil in the area in a position to hold the buildings that are there? As in, we have to look at all factors. Maybe even in case we want to construct an industry. Is the industry going to make profit in that area that we want to build it? So feasibility study is that process of deciding whether to do the project or not. So the work of the quantity surveyor during the feasibility study is to advise on the cost, telling the client we are going to need this amount of money. So he's the cost advisor during the feasibility study to see whether that project is viable to be done. The second work of the quantity surveyor is to do preliminary cost estimates. Preliminary works, they are the works that needs to be done before construction begins. For example, building the site huts, the toilets, the, to be able clearing the site. All these preliminary works needs to be to be done and the cost is separate with that of the construction project so the quantity surveyor will do an estimate of how much it will cost to do the preliminary works the third role of the quantity surveyor is to advise the client on financial matters related to the project the client may not be able to know 
where to get to source for funds if he's taking a loan to do the project or maybe uh, how to maybe he can advise him on how the payment shall be done to the contractor for example if it's an interim if it's a contract where interim payments will be done so he advises the client this amount of money will be needed at this time so this is how to budget for that money the other role of the quantity surveyor is to be able to prepare the bill of quantity and other tender documents the bill of quantity is that document that will be able to show the method of the work that shall be done, the work itself and the price of it. The other tender documents involve like this form of tender, the form of agreement, which are supposed to be prepared by the quantity surveyor in preparation for tendering process. The other role of the quantity surveyor is to be able to advise on the appropriate method of tendering. So the quantity surveyor will advise us should we use open tendering, selective tendering or negotiated tendering based on the type of the project that we are going to use. Six, the quantity surveyor will coordinate and organize, will coordinate and attend site meetings. The site meetings will involve the clients, the consultants and the contractors and the main contractors. Before the project, we need a site meeting. So the quantity survey will be able to organize and also attend the site meetings. Seven, the quantity surveyor will chair the tender opening and evaluation committee. When the tenders are submitted, they need to be opened. So a committee will meet and the chair of that committee will be the quantity surveyor. Also, the tenders need to be evaluated to look into the details of these tenders. So, the quantity surveyor is the one who will chair that meeting. Eight, the tender analysis. We need to do a tender analysis to check the bill of quantity submitted. Are there any errors or omissions in the bill of quantities? So, in that tender analysis committee, the quantity surveyor will chair the meeting. Then the quantity surveyor will build up unit rates, the rates for each item, the cost. The quantity surveyor will build up the unit rate in terms of considering the cost of the materials, the cost of the labor, the profit and overheads required. So he will come up with a unit rate to be used in the bill of quantities. The last role of a quantity surveyor during the pre-contract stage is coming up with a work, work program so that we can be able to know how much the how long the project is likely to take so that we can be able to estimate the cost so he's supposed to come up with a work program so that we can be able to know how long the project will state will take since starting time to the end time Explain four situations that lead to variations in the construction project implementation. We know that variations, there are alteration in the scope of work. The first reason that could lead to change in the scope of work is technological advancement. In case there is some change in technology, for example, we were using some type of tile. Then there came up some new one or we were using some type of lighting for example lighting for outside that was just giving us light then there was some change in technology so there came light that sensed movements then the clients selected that that type of technology where the lights would detect movements so the client because he will change the type of light that he wanted this change will change the scope of work that was supposed to be done so technological advancement could change could lead to a variation the second reason could be statutory changes or enforcement maybe we had designed a, a house that could go for two floors and we wanted to construct it in Modaiga. Then we get there and realize that the statutory rules in that area do not allow a building that has 
to go for more than one floor up, there should be change in scope of the work because we have to stick to that statutory rules. So that could lead to variation because the variation is the change in scope. We'll have to change the plan to fit the statutory rules of the area. The third situation could be non availability of specified materials. Maybe we wanted to use a certain type of finish for the walls. Then when we went to buy, it was quite unavailable in the market because we have to change so that it can still look good like it, it had to. Maybe we have to change a certain wall that will lead to variation non-availability of specified materials. The next one is changes in weather conditions. Maybe we had not foreseen that there could be so heavy rains. Then uh, it rained so heavily. Then the soil was affected. This could lead to a variation because maybe we have to build a retaining wall so that it can be able to hold the building. So these changes could lead to variations. The last situation that could lead to variation is continued development of the design after the contract was awarded. Once the contract is awarded, we stick to the design that was used to do the bill of quantities. But in case the design was altered with, maybe some walls were omitted, they were removed, or others were added, this would lead to variation because once the contractor comes to contract on site, to construct on site, he will have to do that which was not in the original drawings, leading to a variation. The other question is, explain four methods of valuing variations. Valuation, valuation which is valuing, is giving a cost estimate for the changes. The changes are the variations. So we are asked four methods of valuing these variations. One method is using the contract rates. You see the rates that were in the BQ that we used to agree on that contract. In case the work that is to be done, the works that have been added are to be done in the same condition, for example, is of similar character and also to be carried under the similar conditions, this work shall be valued using the contract rates that we used to come into a contract. So the first method is use of contract rates. The other method is using pro rata rates. This is where work is of, which work is not of a similar character, but it is performed in similar conditions. So the QS will come up with a rate using the original rates so that he can be able to quote for the rates to be used for this new work which is not of the similar nature. Maybe it's not constructing walls like the other one, but it is done in the same conditions. Same conditions meaning in the same locality where the prices are the same, but the work is different. So, for pro rata rates is where the work is different but in the same condition. It's use of star rates. Star rates is where the work is not even comparable to the other works that have been done, but the rate can be calculated. So, such work, the work has come up, it is not similar and it's not even comparable to all the other works that have been done in the same site but the rates can be calculated. So the quantity sabia will calculate the rates. So that one is the use of star rates. The last method of valuing variations, variations is using day works. Day works, it is where uh, work is not easy to measure and value. So the contractor and the client will agree that the contractor should keep into account the costs that he is going to add a goal to do the work, then in addition he will be given some more for the profits and overheads. So he will be compensated for what he used, then 
you will add the profits and overheads. So, in conclusion, the four methods of valuing variations. One is using the contract rates, the rates that were in the BQ, if it's of the similar nature, similar condition. Second one, use of prolata rates, where the work is not similar but is done in similar conditions. The third one is use of star rates, where the work is not comparable to the work to the other works in the site but can be measured and priced. The last one is using day works where the work cannot even be measured or priced. Therefore, the contractor has to be compensated for whatever money he shall use to do the work plus profits and overheads. Next question is describe the following type, types of contracts used in building construction process. The first, method, the first contract is the lump sum contracts. The lump sum contract is whereby the contractor and the client agree on a total price. So the contractor and the client will agree this house shall cost 20 million to build. So that price that they have agreed on, they should stick by it. But in cases where they, there are fluctuations such as the price goes up, the client is not to add some more money. They are supposed to stick to the contract sum agreed in the contract. So in case it costs less, the contractor will benefit from higher profits. But in case it costs more, the contractor may suffer loss. The advantage of lump sum contracts is simplicity in bidding. Because we are only looking at the total cost it will be easier to select the contractor because we will not go so much into details. We will only be concerned with the total price. So the, it will be easier to bid for the contractor and even to choose the contractor. Second advantage of the lump sum contract is finishing under budget means higher profit margins for the contractor. So the contractor might like it because even if he spends less, the client will not ask for money from him. He will have to pay on that money that he, they had agreed on. Uh, the disadvantages of the lump sum contracts is that in case of any setbacks for the contractor, maybe he goes through some loss or errors in calculations, the contractor will suffer the loss because he cannot go back to the client to ask for more money. And the other disadvantage is the bigger the project, the more likely to, the contractor is to suffer loss. Because for the large contracts, he might be working with subcontractors and so many suppliers. So in case he misquotes and quotes less money, the contractor will have to go on a loss because he has to pay the contractors and the clients. The other type of contract we are supposed to explain is the cost plus contracts. This is also called the cost reimbursement contracts. This is a contract which involves the contractor doing the project, keeping into account every money, every amount of money that he uses, then at the end of it, the client will compensate him for all the money he has used. Then he shall add his profits and overheads. So a cost plus contract, it is where the contractor will do the job. Then the client will pay him based on the amount he has spent plus the profits and overheads. The costs that the contractor is likely to spend includes both the direct costs and the indirect costs. Cost. Direct costs involving the cost of materials and labor, indirect costs involving the cost of office travel communications, those ones mostly they are the overheads plus the profits. The advantages of the, of the cost plus contract is that one, it is flexible. In case the, the client wants to change the design of the building he can do it because the contractor will not have any issues as long as he will be compensated for all the money he shall use 
plus his profit. So mostly the cost plus contracts are used where a lot of flexibility is required. The second disadvantage for cost plus contracts is that miscalculations are not devastating. In case he does some miscalculation when he's quoting the prices, the the, he can always discuss with the client because him, he will only be compensated for all the work that he does, uh, for all the money that he uses, then he's added profit. So in case he miscalculates before they settle on the project, he can always discuss it with the clients. The other question that is commonly asked is differentiate between net pricing and gross pricing. Gross pricing is where the prices include the taxes and the discounts. Net pricing is where the prices do not include the discounts and the taxes. It's just like a salary. Gross salary, it has taxes inside but net salary is when the taxes have been deducted so for construction gross costs will include the discounts and the taxes net will not include the discounts and the taxes